Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Welcome to our 2X webinar in partnership with the Clean Cooking Alliance on Clean Cooking as a Gender Lens Investment Opportunity. Really thrilled to have you all here and look forward to a very interactive and insightful session with you. Gender and climate has been a key strategic priority for 2X for a long time, as I'm sure you all know. And more recently, we've seen a growing interest among our members and the broader ecosystem of investors in particularly investment opportunities in clean cooking and understanding more about this opportunity at the intersection of gender, climate, health, and other SDG outcomes. At COP26 in Glasgow, as you know, we launched our 2X Gender Smart Climate Finance Toolkit which dives into the business and impact case at the intersection of gender and climate across a variety of different sectors. And at the same uh, COP event, I also had the chance to personally meet with Jaleen from the Clean Cooking Alliance, and we were exploring opportunities for collaboration. So I'm really thrilled that this is the first webinar that we're doing together, hopefully one of many, to really dive into this investment opportunity and learn more about some of the inspiring examples that are already out there, and also what we as 2X and the community of Genderlands investors can do to tap into this opportunity more going forward. So with that, it's my pleasure to turn it over to Angeline from the Clean Cooking Alliance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica. I'm really happy to be here with you all this morning or afternoon, your time, uh, and excited for our fantastic panel who you'll hear from shortly. I am Jeline Connors Belopolsky and the Chief of Staff and External Affairs at the Clean Cooking Alliance. And we work with a network of global business partners to build a vibrant ecosystem to enable the growth of a clean cooking industry that delivers accessible, affordable solutions for all. And I have a few slides here that I'll, I'll walk you through in a bit of a clean cooking uh, introduction and talk about some of the, the trends that we're seeing um, across the sector. So hopefully we'll have those up in a moment. Let's see. All right, um, excellent. And if we can move to the first slide, please. Thank you. Cooking is a fundamental part of life. It's an activity that brings families together and has cultural and social significance around the world. Yet today, billions of people do not have the luxury of safe meal preparation. Instead, they depend on polluting open fires or inefficient climate harming stoves to cook their daily meals. Providing clean energy to households is critical to achieving global climate and sustainable development goals yet we are unacceptably off track to reach our 2030 goal of universal access to clean cooking. Today, 2.6 billion people lack access to clean cooking solutions, costing the world more than $2.4 trillion in damage to the climate and local economies and contributing to more than 4 million premature deaths each year. 120 megatons of climate pollutants are emitted every year from cooking over open fires and inefficient stoves. More than half of black carbon emissions come from burning solid fuels for cooking and heating in homes, making household energy the largest controllable source of black carbon. It is not possible to overstate the urgency for action, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, where access is particularly low and the absolute number of people relying on polluting cooking fuels and stoves continues to rise. Quite simply, clean cooking is the most underinvested health and environmental problem in the world. And women bear a disproportionate share of this cost in the form of poor health and safety, as well as lost productivity and well-being. Not only does cooking endanger their health from inhaling toxic smoke, but they may be removed from school because of domestic work like firewood collection and walk ever greater distances carrying heavy loads due to forest degradation. In conflict settings, women face an increased vulnerability to physical attack when leaving their communities or refugee camps in search of fuel. But the narrative isn't simply one of victimhood. Accelerating access to clean cooking is a critical tool for empowering women and advancing gender equality. 
women are essential to the widespread adoption and use of clean cooking solutions. Their agency as household decision makers and consumers should not be underestimated. And the sector presents opportunities for women to make their mark in a growing market. Their involvement as employees and entrepreneurs helps businesses thrive. But let's take a quick step back. What exactly is clean cooking? Part of the challenge the sector faces is that it's not one thing and one solution does not fit all needs. Clean cooking refers to a suite of fuel and stove combinations with emissions performance that meets the World Health Organization's guidelines for indoor air quality. This category includes high efficiency charcoal and biomass pellet stoves, LPG, biogas, ethanol, and electric stoves and pressure cookers. And yes, I said LPG as in liquefied petroleum gas. We get a lot of questions around how a fossil fuel can be considered a clean cooking solution and one that is aligned with global climate goals. And while some may not like the messaging, the science is clear. LPG burns cleaner than traditional solid fuels without producing significant harmful smoke, fumes, or particulates. And LPG use reduces pressure on land and forests. Today, nearly 35% of wood fuel harvested is unsustainable, contributing to forest degradation and climate change. And the latest research is showing that a global transition to LPG for cooking would indeed be climate positive compared to the current baseline. And it's for these reasons that we're seeing an increasing number of donors and investors like the UK ODA, FMO, and US Treasury make exceptions for LPG cooking in their investment strategies. Changing the way families cook their food each day will slow climate change, drive gender equality, reduce poverty, and provide enormous health benefits. Yet the level of funding and investment in the clean cooking sector has not matched the global magnitude of the challenge, hovering in the tens of millions of dollars. The latest clean cooking industry snapshot report, which will be launched next week, shows that investment in the clean cooking companies has grown at a rate of 20% since 2014. At this rate of growth, which is by no means guaranteed, investment in clean cooking will still fall far below the four and a half billion dollars in annual investment required for universal access. We urgently need greater amounts of capital to flow into the sector. And we need that capital to come from a much wider pool of investors with varying appetites for risk and return. Equity investments have been the largest type of investment in clean cooking companies for the past six years and represented nearly 60% of the total capital deployed in 2020. The private sector remains the dominant source of capital going into clean cooking companies. And the large relative volumes of equity investments coming into the sector imply that it's still nascent, but attractive to early stage equity investors. Fewer equity transactions are reported by clean cooking companies, but on average, these are higher value deals than other types of capital. The average amount of equity being reported by clean cooking companies has been markedly higher in 2019 at $3.9 million per company and 2020 at $3.3 million per company than in previous years. However, only 12% of companies report receiving gender focused investments, and those investments that are through a gender lens tend to be smaller in size than gender agnostic investments. The sector is indeed gaining momentum and the recent investment in business trends we're seeing could represent a turning point. In recent months, several clean cooking enterprises have raised previously unheard of levels of capital. The amount of capital raised in the first part of 2022 is more than double what was reported in 2020. In addition, several enterprises have seen significant customer growth highlighting the potential to deliver pioneering technologies at a transformational scale. The eco ecosystem continues maturing as more businesses and collaborators from other industries develop partnerships and start new initiatives. The first close and launch of the Spark Plus Africa Fund, the first impact fund financing clean cooking solutions with a target fund size of $70 million shows the appetite of a wide range of investors including development finance institutions, private foundations, and pension funds for establishing and funding an emerging commercial industry. 
But to achieve a transition of this scale, clean cooking must be a political, economic, and environmental priority, supported by policies and backed by investments and multi-sector partnerships. To make that kind of change, the level of commitment and scale of investment matter. The incredible success of the 2X challenge and the increased focus on gender lens investment offers an incredible opportunity to unlock capital for clean cooking, which sits at the nexus of gender, climate, and health. It's time to scale up public and private investments to deliver clean cooking solutions in every household to empower women keep families healthy and the environment clean. Thank you so much for your time. And I will hand over to our expert moderator, Julia Sogut. Thank you, Jillian. Thank you for setting the stage um, for our panel discussion on the opportunities of clean cooking as a gender lens investment. And 12%, there's still a lot to do. And on the latest industry trends. So we have three highly knowledgeable and experienced panelists for our discussion today. Rajna Nag Choudhury, Managing Director for Grants and Impact at the Global Innovation Fund. Hanan Marwa, CFO at Circle Gas. And Rocio Perez Ochoa, CEO and founder of Pita Sasa. Now, could you please just give us a brief introduction to yourselves and your organization and a brief statement on the importance or opportunities for gender lens investment in clean cooking based on your experience and your organization's perspective. Um, why don't we start with Hanan? Great, thank you so much, Julia. Um, so I'm CFO of Circle Gas. Um, Circle Gas is a pay-as-you-go LPG distribution company um, serving around 215,000 households in Kenya and Tanzania. It's an urban business um, and they distribute LPG to the homes um, through a network of um, local distribution depots in dense urban areas. Um, we put smart meters in all the homes of our customers and using the smart meter and mobile money, our customers can pay for uh, to access LPG and cook cleanly meal by meal. We also have manufacturing operations in China where we manufacture the smart meter because um, uh, the smart meter is not something you can buy off a shelf. Um, we have proprietary technology in our smart meter that enables the pay-as-you-go facility. It also gives us excellent data about our customers' cooking patterns, um, and we know everything, really, around how and when our customers are cooking. Um, so it's, uh, it's very rich data for us to be able to enhance our customer experience. We have a really extensive impact program. Um, we work, we have a, a collaboration agreement with the University of Liverpool and their School of Public Health. They're really leaders in um, clean cook, analyzing clean cooking and particularly the impact of using LPG on health and climate. Um, and they uh, run studies on our customers um, for people who wanna participate. We also are developing carbon credits and expect to be issuing um, credits later this year. And most importantly, um, with over 200,000 customers, we think we're impacting nearly a million lives and helping them um, act with access to clean cooking. Before joining Circle Gas, I spent the last 10 years in the African electricity sector, working on power plants and distribution, and, um, and also thinking that I knew everything about the energy access spectrum. And I only realized when I met Circle Gas and some of the peer companies that I had really missed um, the emergence of clean cooking or cooking as a, um, a scalable commercial business opportunity. And I also realized that the really the billions of dollars I saw pour into the other aspects of energy access had just completely missed the cooking side of energy. And I really believe that's because cooking is heavily gendered, if that's the right word, and it because it impacts women and children. And so um, really I... Um, really hope that um, people who are not as familiar with clean cooking really take away from this, that first of all, this is going to change, I believe. The next few years are really gonna see, in, in my view, a wave of, of financing on this part of energy access, this most neglected aspect, um, and, um, and, and, and attention that's going to get to this sector. Um, at Circle Gas, uh, really the investment, of, the huge investment opportunity is, well, first of all, because the market is huge and, and we believe we're offering a product uh, that people want. 
in a way that they can now access it because pay-as-you-go increases um, afford the ability for people to be able to afford to cooking with gas. Um, but also um, we provide for our customers use the access to the LPG equipment so that they're only paying for gas. Um, and we make our money back through their use of our equipment and, and the gas over time. So um, therefore we need access to really low cost financing for the equipment, which is installed in customer homes, which is essentially a replacement for gas pipes that you or I might have access to. Um, so there's really a huge opportunity um, for, for, for debt, for equity, for um, so many other instruments in between in this sector tailored to all the business models that we'll touch on today. So um, yeah, really excited to be part of this. Thank you. Thank you, Hanan. Um, Rajana, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, thank you. Thanks, everyone. And thanks for having me here today. Um, I'm really excited to participate in this event with such an interesting panel. Uh, my name is uh, Rachna Nam Chaudhary, and I'm the Managing Director for Grants and Impact at Global Innovation Fund. Uh, Global Innovation Fund, or GIF, is an independent multilateral investment vehicle that works with the mission-aligned development agencies, um, as well as philanthropies and corporates to find and fund evidence-based innovations with the potential for uh, outside social impact at scale. So the way that we sort of achieve this impact is by really financing evidence-backed innovations that we believe have the potential to bring about transformative change for the world's poorest. Uh, we make equity debt uh, and blended investments as well as grants to support entrepreneurs who are scaling up their programs either through the public sector or through markets. Uh, and then we reinvest any of the returns that we get. Um, so far, we have deployed over 100 million uh, and our portfolio is on track to improve lives of over 135 million people by the year 2030. And uh, just six of our initial uh, early investments have generated more than $500 million in social benefits. GIF is uh, strongly committed to gender lens investing and gender is a key theme uh, for our work. And uh, we were sort of able to really accelerate a lot of this work focusing on gender equality over the last two years by creating a sub fund at GIF called the Innovating for Gender Equality Sub Fund which has been really sort of catalytical across uh, GIF in terms of mainstreaming genders uh, in our own processes from sourcing to diligencing and as well as investment structures as well. Um, as impact is sort of a central pillar in our investment thesis and decision-making, uh, GIF is also really committed to rigorously measuring and forecasting impacts of innovations we fund. And uh, we use an innovative set and novel Approach called tactical impact to measure and quantify impacts uh, of all the invest investments we make. And we explicitly now include gender equality outcomes in this methodology, uh, which includes now um, women's agency in decision making, as well as a reduction in gender based violence. And I'm actually going to quickly share with you a link for those who are interested in this on the chat. Um, to un to do more about our uh, methodology and some of the work and focus on uh, gender equality that we do. Uh, we also sort of have embedded gender analysis throughout all of our innovations across different sectors as well. Um, and especially in the delivery value chain and operations and functioning of some of the companies we work with. Now clean cooking is a really exciting sort of investment opportunity for GIF particularly from this gender lens that we've been talking about. So women really are the main users of innovations in this space. And there is significant room to really uh, deliver innovations that specifically tailor and design keeping women, women beneficiaries at the core and at the heart of the sort of company's innovation. Uh, given the number of behavioral um, barriers related to switching cooking fuels, from either kerosene to LPG or from sort of dirty fuels to more cleaner fuels, it becomes essential for innovations to really explicitly understand and internalize barriers and constraints that women face. And in addition, of course, this is very exciting because this explicitly also impacts women, right? So be it health benefits or income benefits, uh, it has a potential to create outsized impact for women uh, you know, with innovative solutions in the clean cooking uh, space. 
It's also sort of critical for the companies that we work with to be mission aligned on this and understand that, you know, uh, these gender dynamics better in their own operations and also reflect them in their own company leadership and staff as well. And that is something that we prioritize as well. So I'm really looking forward to this discussion today and getting more insights from, uh, you know, the other enterprises out there as well as investors. And uh, yeah, that's an introduction on GIF. Thank you, Rajna. Rocio, you want to share also your yeah. organization and yourself? Yeah, can you check my phone is okay? My microphone is good? Okay. Yes, we hear you. Okay, good. Uh, thanks. Uh, my name is Rocio. I'm one of the two co-founders of Vida Sasa. Uh, Vida Sasa is a last mile distribution company based in Kenya, in rural Kenya. Um, and we, we are, as I said, distribution company. Uh, and we are serving specifically the needs of rural women in, in Kenya which obviously includes access to appliances for cooking. That's what we do. We do appliances, we don't do fuels, but it's not the only thing we do. So um, we have a range of products that we sell directly to the ladies in the countryside that includes uh, on the energy side, cooking devices, but also solar products. Despite the, uh, the uh, competition in Kenya, there's still room for us to sell solar products and also agricultural equipment as, um, most people living in the rural areas are farmers in one way or another. So uh, for us, cooking represents maybe 40% of what we sell. Um, uh, and uh, we've been doing uh, cooking since day one. Uh, we started in 2015. So we have quite a lot of experience on understanding the market dynamics from, from, a, from a female or consumer, female co consumer's point of view in rural areas. Uh, what else can I say? We are product agnostic, so we sell appliances, so we don't sell fuels. Uh, and as, as people, as you can imagine, people use several appliances at home. Uh, they use several fuels at home. We don't pass any judgment, but we try to find the best quality product that is available out there within the category of the fuel, right? So if we are talking about wood, we will we'll, try to find the best or the most efficient uh, stove that works with wood, the same for charcoal. LPG obviously is pretty much a commodity, so there's no mystery there, and electric cooking as well. So we have the whole uh, range of products available to our, our clients. Um, so that's, that's really what we do. Uh, and most importantly, I think I, I need to say that without giving access to credit, to these ladies in the countryside, they will not be able to buy any of the products in the catalog. Uh, the appliances by definition are expensive. The, the fuel is also expensive, right? So that's not taking merit uh, from Han, but uh, the appliances is often one of the main barriers, especially if they want to move up in the fuel uh, energy ladder. Um, acquiring the first cylinder is not obvious um, at all. So we, we are in that space. So the appliances side of things, right on the fuel side. And we give these products on credit to all. Um, and we are probably the only company in rural Kenya that is selling uh, stoves and LPG kits and even electric pressure cookers today with uh, credit, with standalone payment plans. And they are not attached to any other larger business loan or a solar home system pay go that switch off you don't pay the stock none of that they are genuinely sold on credit um, and we are not going through um, difficult credit checks and we are not doing any of the traditional uh, MFI um, work because it's completely non-scalable if you do it that way um, instead what we do is we sell on, on credit to people uh, that form groups and we use the group liability um, credit risk management, which is quite well known, uh, especially among our clients as they already work in groups for any kind of thing. So, um, and the group liability for us has worked so far, especially on the cooking side. Uh, the agricultural side also has good repayments. The repayment rates typically for us is like something like 97, 98% of uh, success. Um, and we have obviously a strong gender bias to everything we do. So let me talk about gender, not necessarily because we are doing cooking, it's just because we want to uh, serve a market that has been completely um, kind of forgotten about. Um, rural consumers, especially women rural consumers, have been traditionally been left behind. 
for a variety of reasons, including prejudices that it's not, it's not worth uh, talking about this now because we are all aware of it. But we think that there is an emerging consumer class there that has been neglect neglected and we want to be there for, uh, for them, right? And the needs are varied. It's not just about cooking. They, they are farmers, they need stuff, they need uh, furniture, they need uh, building materials, they need all kinds of consumer goods that we are always exploring and, and trying to see how to, to match the supply and the demand. Um, so definitely gender matters to us because our target market is the rural female consumer by definition. And that means a lot of things. It has a lot of implications on how you build your business model. Um, you know, from how you hire people, how you organize your culture, um, how you deal with your, your target consumers, which may be or maybe not different from men, um, and so on. So we've been doing, I don't know how you call it, gender mainstreaming since day one, um, which means 80% of the uh, clients that we have are women. Uh, on the hiring side, 60% of the people that we hired are women. Obviously, I'm one of the founders, I'm a woman, and try to be a role model on, on the gender side as well as, as founder and owner and, and manager. Uh, so for us, gender is, is like, so that, right? It's, it's pretty much embedded in, in what we do by definition, because we are trying to, to open up that uh, market segment that has been neglected. And, and maybe I stop there. Thanks, Julia, up to you. Thank you, Rocio. Um... Thank you for all of your first statements. Um, now let's get deep into the discussion and um, maybe let's continue with Hanan. Hanan, in 2020, in one of the largest clean cooking private equity deals to date, Circle Gas acquired Copatec's proprietary pay-as-you-go technology for 25 million. Um, how was that investment enabled? How that, has that investment enabled Circle Gas to scale the business model and technology? And what signal do you think it provided to the market? Thank you so much. Um, what was interesting about that transaction was that it not only um, funded the acquisition of the technology of, um, of, Cop of Copa Gas, which had already been operating at a scale, at a reasonable scale for the clean cooking sector, but not a large scale at all in kind of real terms of a few thousand customers in Tanzania. And it, 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 had, an, it had enough funding to pay for the technology, but also to pay for the CapEx needed to extend the model to 20,000 customers in Nairobi as well. So a second market and also 20,000, which was sort of an, another le level of scale, um, which may not sound like a huge number to many of the people on the call, but for this sector with its emerging business models and enabling technology, and um, it, it, was, it was really, I would say two years ago, it, it was quite a big deal. Um, it also enabled us to bring on board um, more experienced management. Um, we, we kept the existing management who were absolutely amazing and our, the Copa Gas head of Tanzania is, is our head of Tanzania. Um, and uh, the CEO is now heading up all of our operations in China um, and is, is innovating with the next generation of the meter and has really scaled up the manufacturing of the smart meter but also to bring on board a um, you know, experienced CEO who'd managed companies with thousands of employees before and done big turnarounds um, and you know, bring on board the rest of the team. So um, when I look around the rest of the sector, and when I look around the sector and I think about barriers to scale for us and others, I think those are some of the really big ones. Um, if you don't have enough um, capital to kind of get to, uh, enough, uh, to get to a scale where you've kind of proven your business model and you can get to initial profitability, that's really something that prevents you from getting to the next level. If you don't have management that have sort of been through it a few times, then that also slows you down. Um, if you can't, um, if you don't have control over your supply chain, and so that um, that's another thing which slows you down, which is why the expansion of manufacturing in China was important for us. So I would say, as an example, um, those are three things that helped us. And just to add a fourth one, um, in that transaction, we also brought on board Safaricom, the, uh, the Vod Vodacom subsidiary in, in, in Kenya as a strategic partner, um, both uh, an operating agreement, a brand agreement, as an, and also an investor and on our board as well. So um, those four things were really critical for us getting to you know, a, a good scale. Thanks. We have a quick question in that regard um, from Douglas Denley. What does the average circle gas customer pay per month in Kenya and Tanzania? 
Um, I, I, I won't go through um, any small scale or big scale financials, but um, I would say that the average customer, um, and we, we charge more for our gas than if you were, if they were to go out and buy a cylinder from a corner shop. And we have to do that in order to cover the cost of our distribution depots, the home delivery, the pay as you go facility on the meter, um, and also the use of the equipment. Um, at the moment um, in Kenya, we're not charging any customers for the use of the equipment, which at the moment is, is all owned by us. So we definitely have to charge a premium for that. So, um, but it's something we're working to see if we can reduce all the time. Thank you. Um, Rajna, the Global Innovation Fund has invested in Pego Energy, uh, a rapidly growing, Kenya, uh, rapidly growing Kenya and clean cooking enterprise. Can you share more on how this investment fits in Global Innovation Fund's gender portfolio and the learning activities you're supporting to help Pago deliver more value to its customers and drive up impacts on lives and livelihoods, especially for women? Yeah, thank you for that question, Amelia. And I'll talk a bit about Pago and why we were we are, we are excited about this investment, but also more focused on the learnings that's coming out from this investment as well. So uh, Pago, you know, works in again the Kenyan context where predominantly, you know, it is charcoal or kerosene that's been used by low-income households, and um, so high upfront cost of something like an LPG, which is a cleaner alternative, is a key barrier to use as well, as well as some sort of supply issues as well. And this is the context in which Pego really comes in with its solution, um, which elevi alleviates sort of the key cost and supply constraints responsible for this continued reliance on uh, you know, fuels that are harmful, particularly uh, in terms of the health impacts that we talked about as well. So Pego's sort of core innovation is a pay-as-you-go smart metering model for uh, specifically targeted to low-income households um, in Kenya. And uh, it's a smart meter coupled with an LPG cylinder, uh, which is, enables this pay-as-you-go technology, along with a distribution model, which um, it's particularly targeted to low-income customers as well. So what really excited GIF about this uh, investment is really sort of its potential in terms of impact potential. And there are three key uh, channels of impact uh, that we look at that all have, of course, a gender lens to it as well. So firstly, um, the health benefits that we talked about, um, you know, in Kenya around there are around 15,000 deaths annually, uh, which has resulted because of household uh, air pollution. And almost 40% of childhood deaths in particular are related to uh, illnesses that are due to uh, household air pollution as well. Um, so we really sort of saw this as a potential to reduce some of the harmful health impacts, ha harmful health impacts because of uh, household air pollution. The second piece was on the cost saving side. So uh, that's predominantly because pay as you go as a model, you know, makes the fuel a bit more affordable, um, as well as LPG is a more efficient fuel as well. So cost savings related to the same amount of energy that you use to cook food is also a benefit. And finally, we also look at from like the mitigation, climate mitigation perspective that, you know, if they, the hypothesis of shifting actually reduces the CO2 emissions as well uh, of kerosene compared to inner LPG fuels as well. And what GIF sort of also added in terms of our additionality as an in investor that sort of prioritizes impact is from a very early on really encouraging uh, Pigo uh, and to co-create and ensure that gender disaggregated and gender data was something that was prioritized. And also, uh, you know, to, for them to create those metrics and to track that regularly. Uh, we also sort of built more partnerships in connecting them. So, for example, with Spring the Accelerator that helped them to think about human-centered design approach from a gender lens, as well as thinking about, you know, composition of the board from a diversity and, and a gender lens perspective also. Now, from a learning so far perspective, we've quite, like, you know, we've been a learning partner and specifically, I'm quite excited. This is fresh off the press. Uh, last year, we um, sort of supported a study with the Basara Center for Behavioral Economics in Kenya to understand impacts, particularly on women, uh, sort of beyond health. So looking at more well-being and financial uh, lives, as well as cooking preferences and household decision making. And uh, these results are, will be public in the next few months. And so I will definitely share it with this group there, but I'll highlight three key sort of results that came out. So one is 
uh, cost savings. So Paygo customers spend significantly less on Bookie Fuel as a share of their income compared to non-customers, specifically because of this pay-as-you-go model, right? So you're not having these lumpy purchases, but you're able to uh, pay as you consume. And of course, this is a very relevant finding uh, from a financial sort of uh, low house impact on low income households perspective. But this links quite directly to the second finding that I really wanted to talk about, which was on decision making. So women, of course, are the key users in terms of, uh, of cooking fuel. But what we saw is that um, households uh, where there was more take up of Pago, so Pago users will tend to be those where women are also making decisions about uh, the financial uh, decisions on which fuel to buy. And that's really interesting because, you know, it, it obviously indicates that um, the uptake is greater in how households where women participate in financial decision making as well. So it has an interesting impact perspective, but also from a business perspective, that makes sense, right? Like, so from a sales perspective, women really are the key customer as well. And finally, I think the one that really um, is interesting is from a time use perspective. So 82% of the customers sort of reported saying that they save time by cooking with Pego, and that's primarily because of the convenience of the Pego service. And the average amount of time uh, that they save is almost equal to full working day per week. And that's huge for women, right? Like, so this is especially important for women who are responsible for purchasing fuel and doing a lot of the cooking. And, you know, as we know, that women are also the ones who bear the brunt of increasing time poverty because of unpaid child care, unpaid care at home and child care. And so time saving is a key way to reduce some of the time poverty that women face as well. So to conclude, I mean, these are some of the learnings that's not just sort of relevant to Bego, but a bit more sort of in the larger ecosystem of other innovations out there as well who are looking at solutions um, and trying to see how really, you know, women play a critical role in terms of the impact as well as uh, as their key sort of client and customer as well. Thank you for those learnings, sharing those learnings. Um, Rocio, how do you see your business and also the broader clean cooking sector developing over the next five to 10 years? Because we have investors here would like to know your take on this. <laughs> Yeah, so. That's a good question. Well, I don't have a clue. I don't have a crystal ball. And my experience dealing with investors is super limited. Um, so historically, Bida Sasa, which has raised debt for inventory, as we are selling on credit as part of our business model, but we have never raised equity, right? So I have no idea about the equity world, and I don't have a clue about if all these panels about gender investments is just panels and words or people are really doing what they are saying they are doing or promising what they are saying they are doing. So my experience on the investment side is really limited. And I can tell you from my point of view, we have maybe four or five loans in place. So we have relationship with lenders. Most of them are impact uh, lenders, a couple of crowdfunding, but they are coming from an impact angle. So subsidized loans and all that. Uh, uh, the gender side and the cooking side, it's been a struggle, right? Uh, there has is is uh, when people say we are doing gen, uh, we are doing energy access, they refer to solar for some reason, right? And like what? Okay, so you need to convince them that energy is just more than solar, which is a big thing. And then the sec then the next hurdle is the LPG because it's fossil fuels, right? And, and, and even if you remove the LPG from the conversation, you know, cooking has this problem that if you are not moving up the energy ladder or the uh, fuel ladder and you are stuck with the biomass, how can you justify investing in, in you know, businesses that are kind of promoting the use of biomass to, to burn despite your, your super efficient stove? So I think investors are in a pickle there. They have to choose between moving to LPG, which is the cleanest available fuel everywhere in the planet because the cylinders move around. They do, right? You don't have to rely on pipe gas or staying in the biomass uh, bucket, which still, you know, burning biomass. So from an investor's point of view, cooking has been really, really difficult. And I can imagine if they have to do something in energy, they go for solar because it's a lot easier. PV, batteries, tick the box, da-da-da, move on. 
but the cooking has its problems, right? And we are stuck, right? I have never been able to raise a single penny to support my LPG business. Never in the last seven years of operation. I have managed to raise money for solar, for cook stoves, super efficient cook stoves, but still cook stoves, and uh, agricultural equipment. But for LPG, it's always been a no, no, no. Um, yeah, big promise around ele electric cooking. Yes, I hope that is the long-term future. And the, as you say, what happens in 10 years time, I hope everybody is cooking uh, with electricity. Will the, will the grid ever reach my clients in the rural areas? I have no idea, you know, it's moving in the right direction. Forget about, um, you know, having a massive panel in your roof that will cause you an arm and a leg. That's never going to happen. Well, electric cooking, you need grid electricity because it's, uh, it's like a head dry and a microwave. You can't really power that with, with a battery. So the future for me is definitely LPG and electricity, definitely. But it will have to, we'll have to come to terms with the LPG negotiation and, you know, have a deal. Let's do it, let's support LPG for the next five, 10 years, and then we move on to electricity cooking. But that conversation, I don't think is happening. And it's a bit of a shame. Yeah, that's a great point. And we will come back to that actually, to the discussion around LPG. Um, yeah, we have a little bit more time left, so let's move on. Hanan, um, there's a tremendous opportunity for the clean cooking sector to leverage carbon finance. And the question is, how can a sector showcase its impact on agenda outcomes and the significant co-benefit in carbon deals, from your opinion? It's a, it's a great question. And um, because we um, our impact program really covers both, we did a lot of thinking um, kind of in, when we were launching in the last couple of years around how do we best use this to facilitate um, fundraising and, and, and our growth. And the carbon market is, is it's well developed, it's well understood. Um, especially in the clean cooking sector, which has been uh, where the where the sale of carbon credits has been such a traditional mainstay of, of, of funding businesses that would otherwise really struggle. Um, so um, uh, going through the carbon credit development process, um, it made sense, but of course there's a huge upfront cost to that for new clean cooking companies launching as well. And in fact, we were only really able to do that with some support and mentoring around this from the Clean Cooking Alliance as well. But now that we're almost at the stage where we can be issuing credits, it, it definitely has paid off. So um, the, car the carbon kind of pathway, if you have support to get there, um, that's kind of obvious. We really wanted though to be able to, um, those, um, those other aspects, the gender and health aspects, we would love to find a way to somehow um, use that to help us grow as well. But I mean, as of now, we don't really, there, there isn't really a, a great way for us to do that. And I'd be interested to hear from the other panelists whether they've 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 managed to do that. Um, maybe I'll just say a quick word about um, the work on gender that we're doing, um, which is something else that the Clean Cooking Alliance has, has helped support us do. Um, we're working with um, some consultants to really help us to be a really gender forward company because I think the biggest one of the biggest takeaways from us on the gender side has been just because we're a clean cooking company and our customers are almost all women and we see the benefits being, you know, largely for women, and the whole family, we cannot be complacent around the way we are as a, as a company or the way we treat our employees and our customers. Um, it's so easy to um, just through the day-to-day -day nuts and bolts of distributing LPG and um, in manufacturing to um, to forget and it's easy to forget that we we live in the same world and culture that everyone else does um, and the same biases and the same pressures which significantly always at the moment in this world disadvantaged women are still there um, so we really want to be as gender forward as we can and we've really re need, realized we needed outside help and advice on that. And we're just because we're in clean cooking doesn't make us gender specialists um, or experts in this area. So I would say that's also been a really big learning for us and we wanna keep going with that. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm just looking at the time and seeing we still want to have some time for the Q&A and we can come back to more questions depending on how the Q&A goes. So thank you definitely for all the development insights so far on clean cooking. Um, 
We would like to open the discussion to the audience for an introductory Q&A. And if you would like to just share comments, any feedback, questions in the chat, um, which we will then direct to, uh, and you can specifically direct it to someone or all three panelists. And actually, maybe meantime, you start hopefully sending in your questions. I want to come back to the LPG discussion because we wondered about um, who here in the audience, which organizations have actually a carve out or exemption for LPG specifically for clean cooking, because we know some do have that specifically for clean cooking. So it would be also nice if the audience would join us in saying yes, X, Y organization, we have the exemption. And so we can get a feeling for maybe that's the way to go in terms of the discussion that uh, Rocio started, right? Um, so please uh, join us in the Q&A section in the chat by sharing where your organization is at. And if you have questions or other comments, um, just share with us. And maybe while the questions come in and while you answer the question on the carve or exemption LPG, um, I would like to add one more question <laughs> to also really a little bit wrap up what we talked about. Um, maybe Rajna, Rusi, and Hanan, each one of you can give a brief um, comment on this is as we have a gender focused audience here, what are the key messages or insight you would like to share with these investors about the opportunity that the cooking sector represents, like in a very general way, what are those four or five um, insights or messages? Can I say something about the gender bit that I haven't, I uh, wanted to mention? Yes. That uh, we, we have been measuring data, we have been collecting data for a long time, so we have quite a lot of statistics here. Um, in terms of behavior and gender and usage of the products that we sell and all that. One of the interesting things that we have found out um, is that of all the different products for cooking that we sell, um, the LPG is the one that I would say has the most gender impact, if you want to call it that way. The reason is that men can also go with LPG. So if we are talking about gender, I think we need to be I think we are a bit stuck with the gender roles and addressing women's needs. And I think we need to go beyond that. Uh, and it's not just about women's needs, it's about um, addressing the discrimination that women have and the, the prejudices and the gender roles that uh, most women in the world um, kind of tie to and they can't escape. And I think LPG and electric, electric cooking have the potential to break down those role models and have the potential to balance domestic chores at home that nobody wants to talk in public. You know, we are talking about, sometimes I always, I feel like we are talking about, let's do the pink Uber, right? Okay, let's take something that already exists, paint it in pink and let's address uh, women's needs because they're also consumers. And I think that's so stale, it's so 1970s. I think we need to go beyond that and we need to talk about gender the problem of gender is to do with people being classified because of the gender into roles that uh, are, are you know, harming them. And the women spending three hours cooking instead of three hours working is really unfair, right? Um, and why are we not talking about that, right? Why are we not talking about balancing gender discrimination? And the cooking side is one of the big elephants in the room. When I look at my data, uh, I look at the stoves, 90% of the people buying the stoves are women. But if I look at my LPG data, surprise, surprise, is more like 60, 40, meaning 40% 40 of people buying stoves are men, right? And when I talk to my ladies and I talk to my clients, you know what they say about LPG? They say, finally, my husband can prepare breakfast. It's such a relief for the women to be able to share the burden of the household chores because they finally have a technology that even the husbands that don't have much time can use, right? So right now we're talking about time usage and, and how these technologies free up time to do other things, but that, in, that also affects men. So let's, let's not just talk about women, 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 and trying to uh, address the needs and, and the, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's about sharing responsibilities in the household 
that for some reason, because it's part of private life, is never really talked about in the open. And that, that's my statistics, 40, 60 for LPG um, clients, um, which is real, it's not made up. Um, and I'll stop there. Thank you, Rocio. We have now questions coming in. Um, Habiba would still like to share a question. Um, can we unmute her? And could you please share, Habiba? Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Nice to be on the call. Um, I actually wanted to just share a comment because I heard um, when something was being asked about um, our LPG experiences and um, um, you know, about um, finding uh, support for deploying LPG. So SAI is currently doing an LPG program in Nigeria called the Nigerian Institutional Clean Cooking Acceleration Scheme. Um, it's to deploy institutional cook stoves for LPG across you know, um, institutional activities like rice for boiling, palm oil making, a uh, special meal we have here called Gary, Gary making, and you know, a number of them, and we have built to under the Nigerian Energy Support Program, um, deploy over 600 of those stoves across um, three states in Nigeria, excuse me. Um, what is interesting about this is that we're currently not getting like financial support to do the project, like to buy the institutional stoves and um, deploy, but we're getting support to actually um, do some sort of behavioral change exercise, uh, marketing and um, pushing the product out there just to um, get uh, acceptance for the product. And uh, this has also, as we are doing it, even though we started with concentrating on institutional, what we're finding is that even the household level cook stoves are beginning to be asked about. So what we're seeing is the people, because we're working, with, we're trying to work with mostly cooperatives who are doing the institutional clean cooking activities. And some of them, they buy it for their groups, you know, so they, 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 they rise for boilers to be in a group. And when they buy for their group, they are like, okay, how do we get one to use for our houses? our homes and all of that. So one thing I'm beginning to, and like um, Rocio said earlier, it also actually really creates an awareness and um, use by men, because now we're seeing that most of the men who are the ones in the production unit are also the ones saying, I would like to buy for my house, you know? So I think that with the right kind of message and with the right kind of um, push, LPG could actually do, and you know, the right kind of um, maybe marketing options, because what we also do is ensure that they buy this by um, structuring payments. So I think LPG can actually um, replace um, the cleaner, but clean, um, cleaner stoves to make it clean, clean cook stoves. I just thought to share that. Thank you. Thank you, Habiba. Um, we have a few more questions from Swati Pujari. She asked, well, excuse me. The context setting mentioned that the investment in clean uh, cooking companies was predominantly equity finance, according to Jillian's presentation. And what do you think is the reason for that? And there are pro probably multiple reasons. I'm not sure any of them are, are really clear. I mean, I think the bottom line is that it is, is such a nascent industry and the equity investments really are the sort of easier way to, to dip your toes in. We do need the full range of you know, capital solutions, as, as Hanan was saying, to really serve the entire sector various stages that companies are at, as well as investments along the entire value chain. We really, it's not just about as much as we need to be supporting the last mile distribution companies, there are lots of pieces that need to come into play along the entire value chain. So we need a full range of capital solutions. I think grants historically were this sort of predominant model um, and those are sort of stagnating at the moment as we're seeing more equity investments come into play but but it's not enough i mean we're talking about four and a half billion dollars a year in investment needed to reach the the scale of universal access and we need the full range of mechanisms and investors providing at all at all stages and this really includes a lot of the the larger kind of ecosystem building investments as well to ensure that governments are able to put in place enabling policies and regulations and embed clean cooking into their nationally determined contributions, their integrated energy plans to set an environment in which you can build a robust industry that can serve the needs of customers. It's very difficult for enterprises to plan and to grow when you have unstable or erratic policy and trade regimes. So, 
we really need investment in the entire ecosystem from the highest sort of levels of increased public investment in the challenge, the one that's integrated into the rest of the climate and energy and economic development plans, all the way through to the various types of patient capital that enterprises need to expand and grow. Thank you, Jill. I see the time. I will just ask one last question and just ask each panelist to say yes or no, um, because this is a yes or no question without going into detail. It's from Ashlyn Quinn. Um, do the panelists feel that if women save time with a faster cooking solution or saving times right, not having to go for the wood, that is automatically gender benefit or doesn't matter how that time saved is used? And basically the question is, um, is it a gender benefit? And then, or do the women actually use that time to do other unpaid additional care work? So just a quick yes and no, that would be great. And then... I can, it's not a simple yes and no question, so I'll quickly maybe in 30 seconds try to answer that. Um, so, the, well, the short answer is that even if it's not used for productive gain in terms of productive activity, it's still a benefit in terms of if it's even used for leisure. It is that because time poverty essentially is lack of time that women have to do other activities. So it still is a benefit. It's not changing norms in terms of shifting unpaid care burden to men. So reduction of time is automatically not going to shift norms by that men are going to help more, but it is still a benefit to women. So I think this is something that's something that we internally sort of think about a lot, but I think it's a really good question, but then it should be valued still. Thank you, Rajna. We are out of time. I'm just going to pass back <laughs> to Jessica to wrap up and thank you for all of your valuable insights. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Hilya, for your uh, facilitation and uh, to our speakers and also for the audience for your great questions and contributions. I think this has been an extremely insightful event and I really hope this is just the first one in a series. I would love to continue the conversation. Now we'll definitely continue um, exploring these investment opportunities across sectors and uh, financial products and, and geographies. Um, in our 2x collaborative, we invite you to join us. So if you aren't a member yet, please consider joining where we are having these discussions uh, every week. And we would also love to continue the collaboration with the Clean Cooking Alliance and having more of these um, public events as well. So thank you so much, everybody. It's been really great. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you all. Have a thank wonderful you. day.